Where we are in class, we covered a lot of different types of models, generative models, self-supervised models. Today we're going to specifically dive deep into language models. Before we do that, um, we've been reading through your project proposals. Personally, I'm through all but four of them. I apologize if you're one of the four. Um, I hope to get through the last four by tonight. Um, put some comments in your Google Doc. If I put some comments with a question, please put an answer in so I understand how you're thinking about it. If there's no question, then you know, keep going and just incorporate the, the comments as you think about things. Um, keep in mind there's a milestone due in April and then the final project uh, report and video presentation is due in May. Um, your homework three is, was due yesterday and your homework four is already released. Um, which is diffusion models, that's the last homework. So you have one homework left and then final project. So today we have a guest lecturer, Hao Lu. Hao Lu is a final year PhD student here at Berkeley. He's done some of the most impressive work on training uh, large models across reinforcement learning, language modeling, multimodal learning, um, video modeling, the whole spectrum. Uh, but today is going to focus on language models. How? Take it away. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so yeah. So today's lecture is about the language model. Um, Peter asked me to talk about the basics and some uh, advances in language models. So uh, here we begin. So in today's uh, lecture, um, I'm going to cover some of the scaling laws, basics and some capabilities of language model. And in the second half, I will talk about some practical guidelines for, for your research or maybe you know, some practical purpose. So language model is everywhere, from chatbot, code copilot, or even image generation or video generation, like Google's Imagine, or OpenAI's recent release, Sora, all these incredible successes are based on language model. Understanding language really well means a lot for various AI applications. So one of the secret sources is our techniques for building language model really leverage enormous computer power. And in today's lecture, I'm going to focus on how these techniques scale with compute and what are the remaining bottlenecks and how, may, how we may address them in the future. So a language model is basically a probability distribution over sequences. We model the likelihood <coughs> distribution, which is parameterized by some theta. And our goal is to model such sequences of tokens. Okay, imagine you have sequence of words, or maybe a sequence of other tokens like virtual tokens or so on. And you want to learn some parameters such that you can capture the distribution of such sequences. So typically, language models are autoregressive we're going to factorize this sequence autoregressively. Basically, the T tokens going to condition on only tokens before that token. And typically, we parameterize the model using transformer, which we will get to later. It's a really simple objective, autoregressive likelihood distribution over sequence of tokens. So why we want to do autoregressive or factorization? We have so many different ways of model language sequences. I would say the primary reason is every bit becomes part of the superation. Because we are, again, we are doing autoregressive prediction, so we have to predict every token. So if you have five words, then all the five words become the prediction targets. This turns out to be crucial for scaling up your language model. 
And another reason is since we are doing autoregress prediction, it's really natural for conversational AI. I think the primary reason that we say the success of ChatGPT is that we can interact with such AI model, and such AI model can predict language so realistically. So basically, the objective is requesting the model to predict the future really well. So what is the maximum likelihood doing? The goal is to make observed data likely under the model. We're going to take many sequences, compute the log likelihood, and we get the average value, and that's our objective function. We're going to try to maximize this objective. So in the Lama language model you probably heard about, we have 1.5 trillion of tokens. And the theta is oftentimes billions of parameters. So during learning, we actually have three stages. The first stage is called large-scale pre-training, where we maximize the likelihood of over a large, very large data set of sequences. Once we have the model, we can fine-tune this model to some specific tasks. Because remember, during pre-training, we model the data distribution, like, and the data is like a trillion for tokens come from the internet. They may not capture the task we really care about for certain tasks, so oftentimes you want to do some a little bit of fine-tuning during a pre-trained model. And the third stage is called learning from feedback. When you have a good model, you want this model to follow user's intention, and the user may give some feedback. And this stage focuses on how to use this human's feedback to align the model. In today's lecture, I'm going to mainly focus on pre-training, because that's where you can build your that basically de determines like how good your model is. And I will spend some time on fine-tuning and learning from feedback. So, so far you may have the question like why we are doing this autoregressive unsupervised learning. This figure is from the LAMA paper showing the pre-training stage. The y-axis, the previously mentioned, the average log likelihood loss. Lower is better. And the x-axis is the number of tokens seen during this training stage. As you can see, we have trillions of tokens during training. And you probably notice that these curves, they are not saturated. They are continuously decreasing. And then we have way more data on the internet for language. So that's one of the major reasons why we do unsupervised learning, because there are so many unlabeled data available. And by training on these trillions or hundreds of trillions of tokens, the model captures the distribution very well and can generalize much better than doing supervised learning. So, you probably heard something called beta lesson from the famous Rich Sarton, which is saying that the major AI successes gonna come from methods that leverage computation. So our goal is to model the data distribution better by adding more compute. So what is compute? 
compute is the forward and backward path. We have a bunch of tokens. We run our model, compute the loss, the back propagation. And that's how we span compute. And this compute are mostly matrix multiplication. And we measure this compute using flops. Because this matrix multiplication are basically doing floating point multiplication and addiction. We can actually estimate the compute cost. I will get to this a bit later. But the formulation here is just to show you that the compute cost C is determined by the, your number of parameters, basically the model size, your data size, and your context dimension and the model hidden dimension. I will explain this a bit later. This is to show that we can add more compute by increasing the number of tokens, by using more parameters, or by using larger context window. So collecting more data, longer the sequence of data, or training bigger models. Why we are doing this? Like, has there evidence showing that if we do this, we indeed get much better AI models. Now I'm going to talk about the token, which is the basic, and then we move to answer the question I previously asked. So I've mentioned the tokens multiple times. We can model byte sequence. It's most general, but oftentimes it's very long, right? So for a single digit, we spend, you know, one byte. So if we're going to model a sequence of language words, you're going to easily have extremely long sequences. I will show later that longer sequences means a lot of more compute. And it's a little bit unnecessary. You know, training is very expensive. And another alternative is to do character based. So if I have a word like hello, I will represent this word using the characters in this word. So you can imagine each word going to have at least a few tokens. And the longer word can have more tokens. So it has a similar problem to byte-based sequence. People tried word-based tokenization. The problem is the model doesn't know that some words, they have very similar semantic meaning. So nowadays, we typically do a trade-off in between. We, some, we use something called byte pair encoding, which I believe was briefly covered in previous lectures. But for those who are not familiar with this, it works by replacing top appearing pair with a new token. So you have a bunch of words, a bunch of sequences. You split this word into sub-word. And then you repeatedly look at, OK, so maybe these two sub-words occur most frequently. Then you find a new token. You basically assign a new token, you know, any token to replace these two appearing um, pair, and you keep repeating this until you reach a certain given vocabulary size.
So people tried to train LSTM with more compute a few years ago, 2017. They basically take LSTM and do what we previously talked about, autoregress mass token prediction on a very large amount of Amazon reviews. After doing this, something interesting happened. They found that there's a neuron in the STM whose value is shown on the x-axis can be controlled, can be used to control the output, output of LSTM. And the y-axis shows the number of LSTM outputs that are either positive or negative. So you can see that by controlling this neuron's value, we can basically generate either positive or negative reviews. So basically, the model learns to understand, to distinguish positive and negative, basically to understand human sentiment. This was considered as a really difficult task back then. And if we take uh, IMDB reviews and check the value of this neuron autoregressively over this um, paragraph, we can again show that the neuron captures human sentiment. Like the red one indicates negative words or sentences, and the more green one indicates more positive sentiment. So that was really interesting. Back then, I think many people like me tried to <laughs> collect more data to play with this or train a little bit bigger LSTM or other alternative neural network architectures. Maybe you can discover something beyond human sentiment. Maybe you can understand more broadly about human language. Because Amazon reviews also contain not just sentiment, also word knowledge. But it was very really mm -hmm. difficult. It was really difficult to train STM. And people wrote a paper about this. People proposed a new architecture called attention Attention scales much better than LSTM. The left figure here shows per token test loss. Okay, per token loss means if I look at a particular position over this 1K, 1,000 tokens, which model can predict this token better? So x axis is a token index. And the y-axis is this, the loss correspond to that particular token. You can see that the, the red lines are LSTM, and the blue lines are for transformer. Across different model size, as we train bigger and bigger neural networks, transformers consistently how to perform LSTM. And we can see that as the context gets longer, gets to 1K tokens, the gap becomes much larger. And this led to the right figure is the model average performance. The XX becomes the parameters because we care about how can we build more capable models by scaling up. So here we see that transformers shows a very beautiful 
linear scaling? Well, LSTMs saturate very early. So I want to briefly recap the transformer architecture. As we previously show, attention allows attending to past tokens without forgetting. LSTM, you have to maintain certain hidden state. But in attention, you can directly attend to any past tokens. The model does not have this information bottleneck. Another reason transformer scales so well is that you can increase your parameters easily by adding bigger MLP networks. And MLP networks is just matrix multiplication, right? Really big matrix multiplication. So it scales really well with our generations of GPUs and TPUs. Something I want to talk about again about the objective is typically we do auto regressive prediction, but you probably heard about other objectives like masked token prediction or prefix token prediction. A good example of this masked or Masked language modeling is BERT. BERT works by taking a sentence, randomly mask out, let's say, 50% of the words, and train the model to predict these masked parts. And the GPT is more like the full language modeling. You condition on previous tokens and predict the next of future tokens. Something in the middle is called a prefix language modeling. It's good to know that. It's not widely used, but it works by, let's say, the first three words here, may the fourth, have bidirectional attention mask. So the word may can attend to force, and the, force, the word force can also attend back to may. But after that, it's autoregressive prediction. Okay, so the word you can only can attend to all the previous token, but the word ways can't attend to you. I want to say that there are some pros and cons of these alternatives. Masked language modeling is really great for certain purposes. Let's say you want to learn an embedding model. It turns out, well, actually intuitively, if you want to learn an embedding, like by embedding, I mean like a, a hidden vector that represents a sentence. Okay, in this case, you probably don't want to do autoregress prediction because the full semantic meaning of this given sentence is best modeled by having the attention mask, at, you know, attending to the sentence bidirectionally, right? Attending to the full sequence. Okay, so if you want to build an embedding model for, you know, like a retrieval for search, then, yeah, you probably want to train a masked language modeling because, you know, it captures the full sentence, captures the semantic meaning better, and it turns out it's an easier task, so you can train, you know, a small BERT model, right? The largest BERT model back then was less than 1 billion parameters. But nowadays, for this autoregressive full language modeling, the 1 billion model is oftentimes too, way too small uh, to be useful. And the prefix language model is uh, interesting intellectually because many of the encoder-decoder models, they can be reformulated as you know, like autoregressive prediction, but with a different attention mask, like a prefix attention mask. 
right? You can think of it as the the bidirectional part is the encoder. It's bidirectional. You know, any words can attend to each other in this window. And then after that, in the autoregressive part, it's the decoder. Okay. So better virtualization is this. The X axis and the Y axis are both, you know, the tokens and they're a sequence of token. And the prefix language model is shown in the middle. And the most widely used language GPT model is the first diagram. So computationally wise, we pay the same, almost the same amount of flaws for these different objectives. But the causal encode, causal decoder turns out to be most scalable. So I guess many of you have probably thought about different alternative architectures for transformers. I want to point out that there was a paper showing that you know, for this Albert or many other really, really interesting ideas, you know, alternative architectures. If we plot the, you know, the pre-training log perplexity against the flops we spend during training. The green line represents the vanilla transformer, and the red lines represent many other, uh, I would say, really interesting ideas, um, alternative models. And most of them, um, you know, they, they do not scale that well. Um, and this is a downstream uh, performance. If we look at the downstream performance, um, most of the arch other architectures uh, seem to be underperformed by transformer. So during your research, um, I would highly recommend to uh, check like this, you know, plot the, how, the, how your you know, um, future new ideas uh, scale against um, flops. And are they, um, do they have better scaling at all than the vanilla transformers? I think it's, it's good to, to check that. Um, and many of the uh, models shown here are actually quite useful for certain cases. So uh, if you are interested, I would encourage you to check them out. They are pretty cool work. So I want to go to the compute cost and uh, give you a sense of how we estimate the compute cost, which is really useful for later slides. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can I a general question? Are you dividing by small b or are you multiplying by small b? Oh, yeah. So, yeah. So this is divided by small d. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, here, uh, sorry about that. This is S. S stands for the sequence length, and uh, it's divided by six times small d. And d is the uh, hidden size. So this is not saying that if we increase hidden size, we cannot get a, a lower computer cost. That's not true because the total parameters, n, the capital N, uh, you know, you have many matrix, right? Uh, so the total parameter scales quadratically with the small d. So um, it actually scales uh, linearly um, with your number of parameters. So larger models has uh, more compute cost. Mm -hmm. Just to be clear, this is the hidden size of the MRP? This is the hidden size of the, um, the input of the MLP or the, uh, the projection dimension. Okay. The hidden size of the MLP is usually four times of the small d, right? You have this expanding factor in MLP network. <coughs> OK, 
Yeah, so I encourage you to evaluate this formula by hand. You know, you can and compute the flops, the number of the parameters. It's good to to do such simple uh, exercise. Um, okay, so for Lama language model, where S is only like 4,000 or 2,000, and the dimension D is only above 4,000 or even 8,000. So S is much smaller than 6 times small d. So typically, we can think of the compute cost spills linearly with the product of number of parameters and the number of tokens. So if we, if we plug in 7 billion parameters and 2 trillion tokens, you can see the flops is, is uh, pretty insane. It's uh, 10 to the power of 22. So this bears the question, we're going to spend this huge amount of compute and training the language model. And we know that it scales linearly with the product of number parameters, model size. Then how do I allocate my model size? Shall I allocate my compute to the model size or the number of tokens? People tried to discover whether there's a, I would say, scaling law or maybe scaling hypothesis. So people train models with different size, different number of tokens. These are the light blue lanes. So people train, you know, like a diff spend different compute that with the x-axis, and then they check the, the test loss on some unseen uh, data set. And then, then they vary the model size and uh, the number of tokens. So, yeah, so they got different um, you know, like uh, the blue lines. And then for each blue lines, you know, each blue lines represents one configuration, right? So we can pick the lowest point, you know, the lowest point for this configuration is like the optimal loss we can achieve for this com particular configuration, you know, this particular um, model size or number of tokens. And then we can draw the black lane, you know, that's basically the minimum loss lane. And it turns out this is a log log uh, correlation. You know, it's more like a power law. You can get the coefficient by, you know, doing the regression. You can fit this uh, black line, you know, the test loss against compute, right? So this is telling us that there seems to be a power law relation between each individual factor and the performance. You know, if I'm not constrained by my data size, then the best way for me to allocate my number of parameters is to, you know, plug in the lump, you know, like if we look at this, the middle uh, plot, right? Uh, it's the test L equals something, you know, um, the variable is D, number of tokens. So if I'm not constrained by my model size, then, then I can just keep increasing the data size and then I get this linearly decreasing loss. So we know how the optimal number of tokens and the parameters scale if we are not constrained by another factor, but actually we are constrained by other factor, right? Because we want to, we have a fixed amount of compute say, and now we know the optimal scaling for each individual factor, right? you know, tokens and the data size, you know, the model size and data size. And since we know the compute say equals something, you know, six times ND, we plug this together, 
then we know that the power law coefficient A and B equals 1, right? So now we know they are equals 1, then simpler, simpler than before now, but how do we allocate compute? There are a bunch of papers studying in this. You know, before GPT-3 came out, OpenAI wrote this paper. Um, actually, it's the, this paper, Scaling Law for Neural Language Model. Um, it's showing as the first row in this table. So OpenAI found that you want to probably allocate more of your compute to your number of parameters. So they think you should train bigger models rather than train more data. And later on, the second row is another paper I will get to more details later. They run a bunch of different experiments using different data sets. And they found that, okay, probably they are roughly equal. You know, maybe the data set, data number um, training data is more important because it's Point, point 0.51, right? I would say the best practice is to train different small models and data sets. And you can fit the constant by yourself, right? You can do something like this, train a bunch of small models. You don't need to train really big models. You can train really small models with different number of tokens, you get a bunch of these blue lanes, you pick their lowest point, draw the black lane, and then you can fit this constant. That's uh, what I would recommend for your research or you know, uh, other purpose. That's mostly reliable. So how, can't you just look it up in a paper like somebody else did? Or what's different about this training that you wrote on yourself? Good question. So this table here shows that these constants are highly dependent on the data size. And since these data sets are not publicly available, right? We don't know what data set OpenAI or DeepMind used. Um, you know, like for my past research, I used the data sets are probably different from other research papers people publish. So the best way to do this is to fit the constants by yourself, and then you can convince the readers that uh, you know, your research idea indeed scales really well. Um, so the Chinchilla paper came out later than OpenAI. They show that, OK, uh, you know, uh, it turns out maybe we should allocate more compute to data. We should train more data rather than, you know, just increasing our model size. This is widely adopted today, so it's a it's a pretty good um, estimation. That I also check this is fits, um, you know, most data sets very well. So this plot shows that. If you follow this scaling law, this chinchilla scaling law, many of the published models before chinchilla, they say GPT-3, Megatron, uh, Gopher, they spend way more parameters, right? So the approach one, approach two, approach three, these three lanes are slightly different estimation according to chinchilla scaling law. You, because you know, when you train model, you have a little bit of different, let's say, hyperparameters and so on. So in the end, your estimation has a little bit of variance. So, but all these three lines show that most of the existing models back then wasted their compute and increasing the model size because these three star. They are all way higher than, you know, 
the three lines during there. So that's not ideal. Yeah, what's the dash name? Oh, the dash name is um, the original OpenAI uh, skill, you know? So basically, the first row here. So they put more weights on the model side. You get it, point seven, not uh, three, yeah. So it turns out after the open AI scale, you know, most of the models after that followed in this scale, you know, they increased the model uh, number of parameter. So we get GPT-3 100 billion, over 100 billion, and then Guafer is almost 300 billions, and the Megatron is like 500 billion parameters. Yeah, so it's more like an empirical observation, right? Uh, so people usually say it's like a scaling law, but I would say it's more like a scaling hypothesis. Uh, we found that if you train different models, look at the minimum loss with, you know, like the minimum loss you can achieve for certain compute, right? That's the first figure. I'll say that again, sorry. Any insights on why, on why it's powerful? Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, I, I don't have a good intuition on like why this powerful holds in practice. Um, I would say, firstly, it's not going to be exponential, right? <laughs> because that's it's going to be very crazy to spend a little bit more time to like exponentially more capable AI model. So it's, it's, it's not exponential, then it's probably the inverse of exponential, right? It's perfect, that's right. <laughs> yeah, I, I would encourage more research on this, like understand why it's oftentimes parallel. It seems parallel holds uh, widely in physics, mathematics, and many other scientific science domain so um yeah does that answer your question good cool so we covered it the basics of skill you know and i hope that's useful for for your work or research um and it turns out if you allocate your compute wisely okay so this figure shows that by spending the same amount of compute you have you have two models okay chinchilla and grofer if you follow the chinchilla scale you know you have a way better model the x-axis is a bunch of different language modeling tasks that people care about these tasks. And the y-axis is how much is Chinchilla better than the Grofer model on that task. And we can see that for most of the tasks, I guess, I would say like between 10% to 30% better performers. You spend the same amount of compute, you get a much better model. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I guess if you compare Chinchilla with other uh, previously available models, I think you will get a different, you know, uh, this plot. Okay. Yeah. So the categories, it's, I mean, categories are just kind of like, not random, right? It's not significant. Mm -hmm. It's not like a very specific, I would say. I would say like the, yeah, you can see like the college mathematics is a little bit worse, right? Um, 
but most of the other tasks, like the other tasks, also lo- look at reasoning, like a high school ge- geometric, high school mathematics. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say there's some. I would say maybe. If you want to get like a model that consistently better than all the tasks, then yeah, I think it depends on many factors, not just the skill you know, right? Skill you know tells you how to spend the compute using your data set. But if the data set is maybe worse than other data sets, you know, maybe another model is trying a better data set higher quality data. This, this scale you know, does not guarantee you a better model. Right? Yeah, yeah. And it scale you know, is more mostly about how do you spend your compute. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question. So, I would say, as people use the word scale, you know, I would say it's more like a hypothesis, you know. Uh, you look at these lines and they are not flat, they are not saturating, you know, this seems to hold across, you know, the x axis is the log scale. So, it, it seems that like this uh, power law holds across different scales. So people hypothesize that, okay, hypothesize that this will be true for, let's say, 10 times or 100 times larger scale. Um, but I can't be sure that, let's say, if we scale the compute by, you know, 1 million times whether this Gonna hold be true. It, it it's it's hard to say. Yeah. Great. Um. And now, suppose you wanna do a, maybe some research, some work related to language model. And. You realize you don't want to train a bunch of small models to fit the constant, right? Like it's it's a lot of work. There are simple rules some I can follow. Yes. So the Chinchilla paper shows this table. And then we let's look at the second column and the fourth column. The second column tells you if you have this amount of flops to spend, and the first column here tells the, the model set, you know, if you have 400 million parameters and this amount of flops, then you probably want to spend 8 billion tokens. Okay, this is a bunch of suggestions. And then we can easily say that the t- number of tokens is roughly 20 times the number of parameters, right? So that's a good rule of thumb. But I would say it's best to double this estimate in practice. So if you're gonna train a one billion model, you probably wanna train 40 billion tokens, you know, rather than 20 times, it's 40 times. Why it's just mm, a suggestion. I feel like, you know, if somebody should this, in their research papers or you know work, then yeah, uh, I think me and many other, most people are gonna be convinced that yeah, this is uh, this is really convincing. This is a good choice. Yeah, great. Um, so does this tell? Does this mean that we have to 
you know, uh, choose, let's say, 40 times number of tokens. You know, we're going to train 1 billion model, then we're going to use 40 billion tokens. Can I use more? Uh, of course. So, um, nowadays people do something called the inference optimal. If you have a lot of compute, let's say, then you want to go way beyond the chinchilla optimal, right? So for 7 billion model, uh, I previously mentioned we want to probably do 20 to 40 times of the number of parameters. So that's about, um, you know, probably 400 billions of tokens. And then we can see that this llama, uh, llama language model, they trained, mm, you know, 1 trillion tokens. Uh, and the motivation is that I only need to train this model once, right? And then I can have a really good model for inference. So if I have, have the computer available, why not spend the computer on training the model really, really long, right? Because at the inference time, you only pay the cost of, for the 7 billion model, right? Or whatever model size you choose. You only need to pay the computer cost for that model. Oh, you make the model's hidden size larger? Number of layers? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it depends. You know, so, you know, you can increase the hidden size or you can increase the number layer or increase both. Uh, typically you increase both. Like, is there a scaling law for the model size? Yeah, what is the scale? Like, increasing the model size? Yeah, um, you probably want to keep the ratio between the, let's say, the number of layers and your hidden dimension fixed as you increase the model parameter. That's a good practice since uh, early days in convolutional neural networks. Yeah. But you don't want to increase the number of layers too much because at the inference time, well, if you increase the number of layers too much, it's sequential, right? It kind of parallels your, it kind of parallels your number of layers, so it slows down your inference. But you also don't want to keep your number of layers fixed and keep increasing your hidden dimension, right? Because neural networks need certain depths to be a good approximator, right? Okay, so this is an interesting observation, I would say, is that the laws turns out to be the determining factor for performance. So now, let's say we train the 7 billion model, and we also train this 765 billion model. What if I want to train a bigger model on fewer number of tokens? Okay, because it's, it's more expensive, right? So maybe I can, I only want to train my, um, much fewer number of tokens. Would I get the same quality model or I'm gonna get a worse model? So I found that if we draw a line here, okay, this red lines, you know, this basically is the same training loss, right? You can think of this as test loss because the, the over the training period, there's no repeating data, okay? So all the data is trained here. It's more like one epoch training. So the training loss is almost test loss, right? Because the loss basically shows how the model perform on new unseen data. So you can think of this as test loss. And if we look at the different model size and pick the point where they get the same train slash test loss, we can see that for the largest model, that's a correspond 200 billion tokens. For the smallest model, that's correspond to 1 trillion tokens. 
Okay, now let's move on to the right of the, the figures, um, the smaller figures. And then we check the 200 billion tokens and also the 100, 1, 1 trillion tokens. Look at this red cross dot. We can see that they get the exact same downstream performance. The Trivia QA is one of the popular benchmark, and the Hellas work is another widely used, uh, pretty difficult task. I didn't check this for other tasks, but you can roughly tell that this holds true across different downstream tasks. So this is really nice. So in practice, we have a new idea or you want to train a model for your company, and so on, you know that if the data set is the same, then the loss, you get, if you get a lower loss with whatever models, whatever model size, you get a better performance. And if you get the same loss, you know, okay, these two models perform roughly the same. So this figure may answer one of the previous questions on how scale in all holds a much larger scale? Yeah, question. I was wondering if like the um, billion trillion the tokens are sample like randomly or like are you scheduling data based on like the uh, quality quote unquote? Since we have just one repo, are we using like low quality data first and then like I don't know, imagine like better data quality in the end? Yeah. Yeah. Is, there, is there some kind of scheduling or are we just like randomly sampling the whole data yeah. that we have? Yeah, so we run we do random sample. Uh, we don't have like a lower quality data and then we put them first. Uh, we don't want to put lower quality data in the pre-training. Uh, because I, I would assume that you know like our data sets they are I don't know. Too small? Yeah, mm -hmm. you have way more data available on the internet. Right. The, the, the difficult part is how you filter this data, right? On the internet, there are almost um, infinite amount of tokens, right? Um, but some of the data are probably not that good. So a good heuristic is Wikipedia is really good data because you know humans spend a lot of efforts uh, on curating them. So, but let's say I don't know, maybe some random websites. Not not good data, right? Uh, not much knowledge. Um, so you need you train a classifier to check against whether this data is similar to Wikipedia. And you do a classification, basically calibrate towards Wikipedia. And if you do this, you have way more data available than than you can you could possibly train. So um, so typically we don't mix. Uh, low quality data into the training. Um, and um, for your second part of question, like do we do any like a curriculum on the sampling? Um, to the best of my knowledge, um, it seems like people don't do that. Um, you know, I, our objective is uh, maximum likelihood, right? And uh, it's probably best if you sample your training data from your distribution right, uniformly, right? Uh, rather than search from, let's say first step from Wikipedia, after training on Wikipedia, we move on to maybe Coral or whatever, right? Uh, that's probably not a good idea. Um, uh, yeah, does that answer? Yeah. Great. Great, so this slide is about, you know, uh, loss pretty much determine the performance. Um, so this slide is showing that turns out in practice, Scalino can predict long way ahead, right? If you look at the x-axis, if the log scale, the number of flops, Scalino holds true across really long range. So, um, I want to talk about one thing. Um, 
which is about the sequence length. It was a major bottleneck in language model or in general, like multimodal model, and so on. So we want to model the world, not just the text. So in the world, we have many videos. Or if we want to train AI agent using trial and error experience, we have long trajectories. If we want to understand the code base or hyperlinked websites or genome sequences, all these require hundreds of millions or even billions of tokens per sequence. And we can't fit this into transformer because transformers attention has a high memory cost. So blockwise parallel transformer is the idea that breaks down normal computation graph for transformer. So attention normally works by modeling the pairwise interaction. Right? You have n tokens, you compute the n to n by n attention weights, right? And then you multiply this attention weight with your value matrix, right? So this attention weight matrix has a quadratic memory cost. And that's not good. You know, if you want to do millions of tokens per sequence, quadratic means you know, we can't even fit this sequence into GPU or TPU or future generation of TPU. Sorry. Yeah, uh, that's a great point. Yeah, we can chunk the sequence, and then each GPU, each device, holds one chunk, right? Is that what I was thinking? Yeah, that's a good idea. One problem with that is attention is n to n, right? Any to any modeling. So GPU one only has one chunk. But GPU, this one chunk also need to attend to any other chunk. But the other chunks are not available on this device. So you need to gather them. You need to communicate them back to the device. So in the end, the, your device is still going to hold the full sequence. But we can't hold the full sequence on one device. So the idea is that we can reorganize the computation ordering. So imagine you're going to compute the n by n matrix. You can take a slice, you know, maybe take a row slice. The, the, you know, the y-axis is query, x-axis is key value, right? Query attempt to key value. That's your attention matrix. You take a slice along the query. And now you have a much smaller matrix. In order to compute this, you can iterate over chunks along the key value sequences. That's called a memory efficient attention. And the blockwise transformer shows that since we're going to break down the computation, you know, we have two loops, one over the query. Each loop, each iteration is responsible for one slice. And in the inner loop, we iterate over the key value sequence. So as we finish one of the inner loop, we have the output for that particular slice, query slice. Then we can go ahead to do the MLP computation. We don't need to wait until the attention finish computation and the entire input sequence. We can finish. You know, we can move on to MLP computation. 
for that particular slice. And doing so, get a much lower memory cost. Wanna save a little bit of time here, so I can probably go back, get back here later on. This is basically an analyze of the memory cost. I can get it back later. This slide shows that if we evaluate this in practice, indeed we get much lower memory cost and in return we can train really long sequences. And this is true for different models. This is Google's recent gamma model. We can, if you apply this technique, you get six times lower memory cost. It's basically six times longer sequence length. But this is not enough to, to do million sequence, sequences. Because the memory cost still scales linearly with your sequence length. And then we can't build the chip arbitrarily large due to physics constraints. And using multiple GPU, as one of the previous questions mentioned, you know, basically chunking the sequence along uh, to multiple GPUs couldn't help because attentions require pairwise interaction. It so turns out we can distribute the query loop across different devices. And then we communicate the key value between devices. How is this different from naively chunk the sequence and distribute them across GPU? Well, the key difference is that now the, the amount of communication is much smaller because as we iterate over the key value sequence, we only need the next one from the next device. We don't need all, all other sequences from all the other devices. So as we do our current key value, we can receive the next key value from next device. And then at the same time, we can send our copy to the previous device. Like this is like in a ring, you have multiple devices there. You can conceptualize them as a ring and uh, each device communicate with the nearby device. The key insight here is that you can fully overlap the communication by using the blockwise transformer. I think I want to mention the asthmatic intensity here. So what is asthmatic intensity? It stands for the ratio between the computation and the communication. So let's say if I send a matrix, two matrix to GPU, that these two matrix require a certain number of bytes, right, to communicate. And the GPU do the matrix multiplication, right, it's gonna take some flops, take some time, okay? So the amount of flops needed divided by the number of bytes you need to communicate this matrix is called asthmatic intensity. And this table here, I will get back to them later, because I some other stuff I want to talk about. This, the takeaway here is that after we reorganize the computation graph, can easily overlap all the communication costs. So using multiple GPUs, training on millions of tokens per sequence, does not incur any overhead. 
So you don't pay an extra price for doing that. Just give this. This figure shows that in the end-to-end -end large scale training, using block wise transform and ring attention, you can do hundreds of times longer sequence length than any prior state of art. So essentially, you are only bound by the number of GPUs. And there's no bottleneck on the contact size. So you can train almost up training longer sequence length. You can train on videos, you can train on entire books, and so on. And uh, I guess we can take a brief break here. Oh, yeah, question. Yeah, it's exact attention, and it's compatible with approximations because we essentially break down the end-to-end -end interaction into piece by piece, like a chunk by chunk. So if you want to apply certain approximation techniques, you can apply them. Uh, as a, yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. So, since ring attention applies to inference case, right? You can split your key value cache across de different devices. The, the technique page data attention you mentioned is for managing key value cache in memory, right? Better placement in memory. So, I think they are complementary. One focus on how do I distribute really long key value cache across the device? And then one focus on the page data attention focus on how may I better manage the memory placement on each device. So yeah, so they are complementary. So I want to talk about some multi-modal model briefly, and then next lecture we're gonna dive deeper. Um, since we can do million and sequence modeling, it becomes natural to model not only text. You know, we have books, we have long paragraphs, but the world is not just text. The world is not only human discovery and knowledge. It's also about the virtual world, action, and so on. So it, it's very natural to model entire world, both vision and the text. It turns out with block wise transformer and ring attention, we can get highly effective one million context window. This is a test and the model's performance in terms of retrieving facts from the input context. X-axis is the input length. The range is from 1K to 1 million. Y-axis is the location of a randomly placed fact. And the green represents model accurately retrieved the fact. So the figure shows that model can indeed has a highly effective one million context window. And this model outperforms GPT-4 and Gemini. Gemini gets like 50% accuracy across, across their context window, and GPT-4 can do up to 100K. And with these techniques, it now becomes possible to do millions of sequence net. In, this, in the next lecture, we're gonna dive deeper on this. But here's is a 
some quick previews of what you can do if you train autoregressive models and text and the videos. The model can generate videos, can generate text, images, and can understand questions about all these modalities. These examples are probably not as impressive as Sora, but you can easily scale up these autoregressive models as we talked about in the previous half, the first half of the lecture. Autoregressive models scale very well. And now you can also model extremely long sequences. Since it's autoregress, model can answer your questions about input, whether it's text, images, or hour long videos. While shorter context model like GPT-4 or Gemini couldn't understand. The recent Gemini 1.5 model is very impressive. They also scaled this context length to 1 million. And these two figures show how the low scale across the sequence position. Interestingly, all these curves behave like power law, but the x-axis is no longer compute, is the sequence dimension, is it's more like the sequence position. And we see that as you build longer context window, the model gets consistently lower prediction loss. The model understands the text better, and more interestingly, the model understands the code really well. You can see this, the right figure is the loss on the, code, on the code. The code is really complicated, so by conditioning on more context, the model can predict code much better. You can see the trend is long stopping, and at the 10 million location, it's even outperformed the scaling power of fitted curve. So, as you from the Gemini 1.5, it shows that with one million context photo can directly analyze the entire code repo. So now we are not very far away from generating the entire code base. or understand a really complex document, like over 1,000 pages. And this, their, this, their model can even outperform the state of art whisper. Whisper, who, who, for those who don't know, it's more like it's an uh, audio to text model from OpenAI. And this shows the power of end end to end general solution. You train a single model and all the different modalities end to end. And the model performs much better than if you train two different state of art models, Whisper and GPT four. You put them together, it's much worse than a general solution. And what's impressive is that you, show you can do low resources translation. So there's a language called Kalamon that basically there only exists like 250k tokens. That's the amount of tokens available um, in, in this world. And it's really hard for human to understand. 
but if you put this grammar book, all the available information available, put this in the context window, turns out this AI model can translate, can understand the grammar extremely well. Outperforms the human expert who speak in this language. So that's about longer sequence. Now I want to talk about some other uh, things. Um, so this is called flash attention. Um, flash attention is about how we reduce data movement during training. So previously we talked about how we reorganize attention computation graph. But in modern machines, we have a uh, hierarchy. We have really fast GPU S run. We have a much larger but much slower memory called HBM. HBM is usually the memory you are aware, you know, like uh, A100, 88 gigabytes, that's the uh, HBM. And when you do the computation, you want to load whatever tensors you want into the SRAN to do the matrix multiplication. But the SRAN is small. It's really expensive. You can't build a really large SRAN. So this work designed, they basically implement uh, you know, a CUDA implementation that explicitly tell the compiler, OK, keep this um, attention weight you know, a chunk in the S1. Don't move it out to HBN, because that's immediately needed for attention weight multiply value uh, matrix. So straightforward, but this needs to um, better compute, better throughput. So this is. Um, maybe a better visualization of how the uh, compute works. You have query chunk and a key value chunk. And the red one shows that which part should be stored in S1. And the principle is whatever you need immediately next, you store that into S1. You don't want to move that back and forth because that takes time. OK, that's the principle. And this is called flash attention. It outperforms the vanilla PyTouch built-in uh, attention computation. And uh, in flash attention, one, they somehow choose there to do key value as an out loop, the query as an inner loop. But as we previously mentioned, the query is independent from each other. So query should be outer loop, right? You can minimize the communication. So that's also simpler. So inflation tool, they switched it this back. Uh, that again brings another uh, pretty significant uh, boost. So um, tool use and the retrieval. You know, um, it's not sufficient to just train a language model and. And then we hope that uh, this language model can do everything. Because we don't have the language model that does not have access to up to date information. It's trained on the data set that you previously curated. And it doesn't know some fractional knowledge because you it's really difficult to minimize your loss to you know zero, right? Uh, so model does not compress all the factual knowledge. And as we want to build really capable AI models, we hope these models are as smart as humans in utilizing external tools. So there's a wide research area on this, but I'm going to only give an example on retrieval. But you can check out uh, some reference later on. Um, about um, other exciting research. 
So there's a paper called Retro uh, that aims to retrieve information from a given data set. Okay, the idea is maybe some information that are not encoded in the language model yet can be retrieved somehow to improve the language model prediction. The idea is they trained a BERT embedding, you know, a really tiny small model, and then they do continuous labor retrieval. What do I mean by that? You have an input token sequence, you run that through the BERT embedding, you also run the data set through BERT embedding. You have so many uh, embeddings, and then you do k-nearest labor retrieval, find the labors, and put these labors back uh, into this cross attention uh, in uh, these neural networks. So it's not just self-attention. It's also attending to retrieve the other neighbors. OK, uh, that's the idea. This is a retrieval part. You see, you can pre, you can basically cache the uh, embeddings for the data set to save compute, and then run a frozen k and then retriever. And they designed some um, ways to um, accelerate this computation. Um, we, we we can skip that. Um, so they show that by incorporating such retrieval from external data sets um, for certain tasks that are about, you know, mostly focused on like fractal stuff and so on, um, they get a better scaling. So for the same amount of parameters, you know, remember there are some extra bird parameters, but bird is small model there. So um, they get a consistently better performance. That shows the benefit of doing retrieval. And uh, across different tasks, this, the big scan can seems come from like, GitHub and PG19. PG19 is a book data set. Okay. So uh, this seems to indicate that uh, retrieval is most helpful when you can't attend to the full context. Right. So GitHub is pretty long, and uh, books is pretty long. So if you can't train long context model, then one way is to do retrieval, you know, to uh, retrieval whatever uh, needed information to help prediction, okay? Um, so some alternatives to the uh, self-attention uh, architecture. So uh, something is called a sliding window attention. Um, so in the vanilla attention, we each token attend to all the previous tokens. And you know that means a lot of computation cost, right? It's an quadratic computation cost. And although we have techniques to reduce the memory cost, you know we can train millions of context lengths, uh, but the compute cost is still there. So one way to reduce compute cost is do the sliding window attention. Um, the idea is that um, as we uh, attend to a fixed window and as we go deeper in the layers, um, each token effectively attend to distant uh, past. Okay, so this is a, a like a, a trade-off uh, between vanilla attention and uh, you know maybe uh, recurrent neural networks. So because this is still fast to train and uh, and it seems to work well in practice. Not as good as vanilla attention, but you know yeah, it's uh, it's good to know about this. Um, and another, I would say, pretty promising alternative to uh, attention is called a state space model. Um, it's a pretty promising idea, though uh, it's a little bit unclear how it would s s scale compared with transformer. Uh, but yeah, it's good to know about this. The idea is, uh, uh, I won't go f into the full detail, but the idea is um, it, it's kind of like a recurrent neural network architecture. Um, the model maintains some hidden state about distant past. Uh, but rather than doing this uh, in the you know, LSTM you know, kind of uh, exact sequential way, they can somehow 
accelerate this a little bit by, by paralyzing uh, some of the computation. So it's pretty promising because it shows faster inference, uh, and uh, which which is ideal for many of the applications, uh, and they, it's also better than RNN. So yeah, it, yeah, but yeah, gets more research and needed. Um, so this is a, a a recent model called Mamba. Um, one of the uh, models in state space model family. Um, this is a, a scaling law study from their paper. Um, we can see that uh, MAMBA performs, outperforms all the past, all the previous state space model uh, in terms of scaling because all the past models, they, see they were not able to uh, match transformers scaling. Um, and the MAMBA seems to uh, match transformers. Uh, and this, this is a very small scale. This is like a one billion model, three billion model. It's pretty small scale, but it seems to match uh, transformers uh, pretty well. Uh, although, as as you can see, as you scale up the compute, the curve seems to go a little bit higher than transformers. So, uh, but I would say this is a pretty promising idea. Yeah. So people also explore how can we maybe combine attention with state space model because a state space model seem to underperform by uh, transformers. So maybe you can somehow combine them together. Uh, so one way to do that is called uh, how about combining sliding window attention, right? So it, it, it's a, a relatively cheap form of attention uh, to model the long range dependency, right? Because in recurrent neural network. Uh, you know, state space model, they can't model long range dependency that well uh, because you have to store information into a fixed data hidden state. Um, so, people explored how to combine them. Um, and uh, this is from a recent paper called BASED. Um, they, they, they basically show that uh, by combining these two on this simple retrieval task, you can somehow uh, they can get pretty close to uh, one linear attention neural networks and outperform um, state space mount only models like MAMBA or some other model. They are, you know, they perform worse than this new architecture. So um, this is a concurrent work from DeepMind. Um, you need the same idea. Um, Combining this kind of uh, attention with some recurrent neural networks, um, it's good to know about them. Uh, this is a, a, a downstream evaluation across some tasks people care about. Uh, so we can see that if we look at the average performers, this model, this blue highlighted models, uh, perform quite competitive with uh, um, vanilla transformer. Uh, and also, you can see, using half of the data, they outperform state space model only models that used it twice much tokens. So uh, this shows that attention is uh, seems uh, pretty crucial for uh, high performing models, uh, but uh, state space model could also be combined together to improve uh, maybe uh, inference efficiency, as shown here. Uh, uh, these uh, hybrid models has a uh, uh, pretty uh, cool uh, inference efficiency compared with uh, the MQA stands for the vanilla transformer, and the other two uh, newly proposed hybrid models. So they have they scale better in at the inference. They have better um, support. So I. I Previous mentioned the key value cache multiple times. Uh, so let's do a recap on that. Um, so at the inference time, giving a input sequence prompt um, for the following questions. You know, like uh, as the model answers the question, you know, generate the autoregress output. Each word, you know, the query only need to attend to the cache data input, right? We don't need to recompute everything, right? We can have cache the input and only need to do the query and the cache data key value computation. 
this may explain that well um the um the pink pink data parts are basically the cache did key value um so with for new queries uh we can um save a lot of computation by only doing this query attending to cache that key value. Oh, oh. Yeah. Doesn't it assume it's linear? Or where's the softmax in this? Softmax over key value? Softmax over key query. Key query? Don't you have to do a softmax after the key query multiplication? Yes, you need to do that. Yeah. So you have the full key value available. Well, keys and values are separately cached. Yeah, they are cached. Right. Yeah, yeah. So the the saved data computation comes from not recomputing the key value. Right. Yeah. So the computation cost becomes linear. But the, lin the linear with respect to cached data key value size. So we, as the key value size gets bigger, the linear cost also goes up. So this may explain that. Um, you gradually uh, cache the uh, key value for previous tokens, and such that for new token, we don't need to recompute the past key value. And yeah, saving the compute is nice, but The bottleneck is loading the key value. Um, so this figure shows that um, ever since AnnexNet came out, you know, 2012, we are keep building better and better GPUs. Um, they have exponentially increasing flops on each GPUs, but the memory bandwidth scales very slowly. So the time needed to load the key value cache increases as we have longer and longer input. So saving compute is great, but the time is dominated by loading key value cache. And it also incurs a pretty significant memory cost. So this figure shows that if we go from sequence 500 to 100K, most of the memory cost comes from saving the key value cache. So people propose techniques to compress key value cache, um, which I want to get into. Um, it's pr there are many cool techniques in this direction. I encourage you to check them out. Um, and I want to highlight this one particular is that they show by uh, compressing the key value cache, um, they, we can still get nearly the same quality. So, as we, so basically showing that there are a lot of redundancies in key value cache. So we can basically compress them without significantly damaging the model performance. And a more uh, a very popular technique is called multi-query attention. Um, in the multi-query attention, we have only one key value for different queries. Okay, so basically you have a, we have a, uh, 32 number of attention heads, right, typically. So rather than having 32 key value per token and 32 queries, query head per token, let's reduce the number of key value to one. Okay, this is called a multi-query because you have one key value and you have multiple queries, so that, that's why they call it as multi-query. Um, the benefits is that you don't need to load 32 different key value 
per token. You only need to load. Yeah, you have 32 number of head times fewer key value to load. But that, that, that actually turns out to hurt model performance quite significantly because we know multi-head is quite crucial for model performance. So uh, there's a technique called group query attention. Uh, it's more like a trade-off. Um, you know, instead of 32, instead of one, it's maybe have a four um, <coughs> key value. And then we group the queries into four groups. So within each group, the queries attend to uh, you know, that particular uh, key value. This, this turns out to give a very nice trade-off between inference speed and performance. So you can see that the, the GQA model has uh, the best, the, high, the fast speed to sample, and also has the high, you know, the second best uh, performance uh, among these different variants. And in practice, you can convert your multi-head attention to GQA or to uh, MQA um, by just, you know, you can maybe merge some of the head together by taking the average, for instance, and then train, continue train the model on additional small percentage of data. So this figure shows that you only need maybe 10% of your pre-training data to successfully convert uh, the pre-trained multi-head attention to group query attention. So something uh, on the hardware side to be aware of is potentially we can have much bigger bandwidth by stacking the memory on top of GPU die. Why is that? I think as AI researchers, we need to know where these bottlenecks coming from. So in existing chips, we place the memory next to the GPU die. So the flops scales with the GPU die, right? The bigger the area, the more flops. But your bandwidth can only scale with the parameter of your GPU die, right? Because you put your memory next to the GPU die, so you can only talk to the GPU using the parameter. So that explains the gap between flops and the bandwidth. So there are so many, uh, many cool research techniques on you know, reducing the memory bandwidth cost, you know, designing new architectures like a state space model and so on. But as we put the memory on top of GPU die, both flops and the bandwidth can scale with the area. That could close the gap between flops and the bandwidth. Once that's true, I think there are a lot of companies, NVIDIA and um, AMD, are uh, heavily investigating this. Once this is true, we can also run matrix vector multiplication very, very efficiently. We can run large context inference very efficiently. So there are a lot of research opportunities. There are some ideas that couldn't, that were considered impractical, could potentially become really impactful in the future. So, um, mixture of experts. It's, uh, you probably heard about that due to GPT-4, um, you know, like, like people talk about GPT-4 is a mixture of experts. So why we need a mixture of experts and what is mixture of experts? Experts here, stand for the number of MLP networks in each transformer layer. And originally, we have one MLP followed by following attention. And actually, you can have multiple MLPs. 
you know, and then you have uh, some, you train some neural network to select which one or which two or multiple from this group, you know, from these many potentially, you know, 32 or even more MLPs to do the forward. So this works um, per token, okay, it's good to know that. We do this per token, we select, you know, maybe one of the MLP to do the computation. So what's the motivation, right? Why we do something like that? Why not we train a giant MLP? The motivation is we want to decouple computation from the parameters. Normally, the compute is bounded to the parameters, right? Remember the compute cost, say, equals roughly like six times your parameters and data size. So if you want to increase your number of parameters, you want to train a bigger neural networks, you have to pay more compute cost. And typically, you want to decouple these things. You know, decoupling means more flexibility. And the mixture of experts, in my opinion, is a way to decouple compute and the parameters. So the recent Mistral model shows this very nicely. They show that you can have eight MLPs per layer, and they decide to activate two out of the eight per token. Okay, so they didn't increase the compute cost or the, you know, dramatically. It's still reasonable compute, but there are a lot of more parameters, almost eight times more parameters, because most of the parameters are in MLP. So now they have eight times more prime MLPs, they have eight times more parameters. In return, yeah, question. Oh yeah, um, no problem. Yeah, what, what's the question? Uh, I was wondering, so like basically, you, you said you select n out of the, all the um, and all the, out of all the experts, you select n to so run, right? Yeah, let's say you have thirty-two experts. Maybe you want to select one or two, and what what matters is the ratio. Okay, you could have two fifty-six experts and select eight, and then, then the ratio is uh, I don't know, maybe uh, 30, six, 32 or something. Yeah. Um, Anyway, the ratio is what matters, uh, and uh, yeah, mm -hmm. what, what's the question again? Well, so I was wondering, it seems like, how is that selection procedure continuous, or I mean, differentiable? Because I feel like if you just selected one, like how do you learn this sort of selection procedure, right? Because like if it's a dis continuous, if it's a like, discontinuous choice, like oh, I'm going to take this one or this one, how do you learn with gradient descent which one has to select? Is it like continuous approximation? Yeah, so good question. You can think of this as a classification problem, right? You have eight experts, and you want to select one. So you can do output eight logits and see which one is the largest, and then select that one. Okay, and that's the, that's the one you're going to send your... Yeah, that's the one you're going to use for the forward, forward and backward for this token. So you're going to predict which expert to use for every token. Yeah. Yeah. So learning this selection module is, uh, uh, I would say, is the bottleneck. You know, right? Because predicting which expert to use is a difficult problem intuitively, right? Um, yeah. It it is. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's a good intuition. So, but uh, yeah. But using multiple experts, the the branded benefits is quite significant, even if learning the um, the routing module is difficult. Yeah. So th this basically shows that uh, by increasing experts to eight, you get uh, a model that outperforms even bigger models, right? Um, it even outperforms NAMAS. 70 billion parameters, so it's pretty impressive. Um, although the data sets are also different. Um, 
Okay, so um, another way to look at this is the number of active parameters. Okay, question. Yeah. Yeah, this is sort of the add-on to the previous question. Uh, let's say you only have one expert. How do you, uh, when, you're, when you're doing gradient descent, it seems like you wouldn't have information. Like, if there's eight experts and you're only choosing to run one of them, it's you don't really have a method of determining which of the other seven ones would have been better to run in that situation. So, like, I guess you don't really have the gradients needed to say that you should increase the classifier's probability of choosing any of those other seven. Is there? Can you clarify exactly how it knows to? choose one of the other seven that it didn't choose? Yeah, people tune their temperature to as a hyperparameter that encourages the model to maybe explore other experts rather than blindly choose uh, according to the logics. Yeah. And uh, I think there are even other techniques like maybe adding an entropy uh, regularization to encourage uh, exploration to other experts. Yeah. Yeah, that's indeed a problem. That you know, if you have eight experts and you only select one, then there's a probability that the model maybe tends to choose only one of them, and then the other seven experts are not sufficiently trained. You know, and yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, isn't the alternative to during training just do a soft combination of the experts? Yeah, that's a good point. If you do soft confirmation, then we are not decoupling compute from parameters. Just during training to get better back propagation. Oh. You turn down the temperature, and it becomes more and more selective over time. And at inference time, you can just sample. Yeah, yeah, that's doable. Uh, I think people tried that. And it, uh, I, I would say that's a good idea. You know, you only pay the extra compute cost at the training time but not a test time. But there's a gap, right? If you use all the experts during training, and then at the inference time, you only use maybe two experts, then how could the model know? Um, yeah, I mean, you'd want to turn down the temperature gradually. During gradually. Training, so that it, even during training, can barely use the others, right? So oh. the others goes down to roughly zero. Oh, I see. So to just like the softmax on, on the values would be like a softmax on the experts, effectively. Oh, I see what you mean. Gradually decrease the temperature, mm -hmm. so model gradually learns to use only one or two experts. Yep. Yeah, that's a great idea. I, I think it's a, it makes sense. Yeah. You don't think it's done? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, I am not aware of such work. This be equivalent in some ways like if you enforce the end they have only had one matrix, but you first it was dangled for the block. Uh-huh. And then you would kind of create experts again and I mean like are they is the dimension of each expert like kind of merged if they just go into the same dimension or does each expert have, like go to a, a separate part of your output? I don't um, know if that was clear. So once you select this output let's say one expert, one MLP, the output from this expert is faded into the nest layer. Okay, but each expert basically outputs the same dimensions, right? It's the yeah, same, okay. same dimension. Yeah. I think so technically you can do... It's not zero, zero, where else it's really available. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, if you do zero and then use a giant matrix, then you are still paying the flaws, right? Cool, uh, so this shows that using the same number of active parameters in the MLE and mixture of experts outperforms long mixture of expert model. So this shows the benefit of doing, you know, uh, decoupling compute and the parameters. Something interesting is that although, you know, um, Several years ago, when Hinton and his colleagues proposed this mixture of expert idea, they were thinking about, you know, like a, maybe one expert correspond to one particular topic or domain. But it turns out, in language model, you know, if you look at archive, GitHub, 
or papers and you know these different domains or clusters, and you look at how each layer select which expert to use. There seems no correlation between certain expert and uh, certain topics. So um, this again confirms the hypothesis that the benefit is de comes from decoupling parameters and compute, not from like you know I, I um, maybe it's better to learn one expert for archive, one expert for GitHub, and so on. It's, it doesn't seem to be so. Uh, although that'd be nice, uh, that seems more inter interpretable. Um, all right. Um, let's talk about some language model capabilities, um, some reasoning capabilities. <coughs> so, a few years ago, and probably still true today, is Although we have really capable AI models that can generate the code, can answer questions, or you know, like where to have lunch and dinner, and so on, they are mysteriously bad at reasoning, and particularly on asthmatic reasoning. This is the bottleneck. Because if the model can't do re simple reasoning really well, how can we trust the AI models to discover new technique or to become AI doctors or AI lawyers and so on? So how may we address this problem? The dominating approach so far is fine-tuning on a lot of data. Okay, you have a human write something like this, you know. You hire a bunch of human labelers, write down the step-by-step -step thinking of these asthmatic problems. And you hope these models can learn to do this step-by-step -step thinking at inference time to give you a better answer. Yes, indeed, it works very well. As you increase the training set size, the test accuracy continue to go up. Although it's still pretty low, that, that because this is this is a paper from a few years ago. Nowadays, you can get like eighty percent accuracy, uh, pretty easily. And the reason is we get a way better pre-training model. We spend way more efforts on connecting this fine-tuning data. So, fine tuning requires a lot of data here for this reason, for improving models reasoning. One way to improve this is called Scratchpad. Scratchpad works by having really detailed step by step thinking as training data. You know, for this particular example here, rather than having the Final answer directly, as in this example, right? You have this example directly. You write down the thinking process. You even write down the language explanation, you know, as a comment. And then you find the model to predict this. It works very well. The intuition, because models have fixed the number of layers, so model can only do number of layers steps thinking if you only allow the model to do one forward pass, right? And that's not enough for most of the problems we care about. You know, we have 32 layers, and that's not enough, 32 steps not enough for most problems. But if you allow the model to do step-by-step, step, you know, multi-step thinking along the context dimension, you know, we have really big context, right? If you allow the model, you teach the model to do step-by-step step thinking, then theoretically, you are almost getting a Turing machine that can use the tape, you know, 
an infinitely large tape. That's the intuition, and this is a, a really cool technique for improving reasoning. But it seems that there's a, there are some other bottlenecks. You know, as you can see, the the out of distribution accuracy. You know, the rightmost figure uh, is still pretty low, uh, showing that the model doesn't seem to really understand how to do the reasoning. Um, so yeah, more research needed here. So the scratch pad requires fine tuning. People found that, OK, I don't want to do fine tuning. Can I just tell the model the step-by-step -step thinking? Give it a few to give the model some examples, you know, a few short prompting. And then hopefully the model learns to do that. And this is called a chain of thought prompting. They put multiple examples of scratch pad as input. And the model imitates the few short prompts. This indeed leads to performance that's even close to supervised fine tuning. So pretty cool that model seems to understand the reasoning from few short examples and can perform competitively with fine tuned model. Later on, researchers found that maybe you, maybe you don't need the few short examples. Maybe just ask the model to, to think step by step. Uh, this is called zero short term sort. So the model directly output the thinking process. I'm guessing that this is because later on, you know, with instruct GPT and other more capable models, they were already trained on some of this kind of step by step thinking data. So you we don't we no longer need to write the prompts anymore. Uh, because you know, over on the internet, there are many such data. Um, so it's really cool to see that you can prompt the model with just one sentence. So you uh, let the model generate the reasoning, and then you do the reasoning uh, to get the final answer. Yeah, it uh, performs pretty well. Uh, and uh, performs, performs the best on um, the largest model uh, available. I, I, I guess with larger models, they capture such step-by-step -step thinking data in the data set better than small model because they have more capability to, to mem re memorize uh, these uh, particular examples on the internet. This is indeed true for all the models available today because they are heavily instruction fine-tuned using uh, this kind of step-by-step -step thinking. So, so we can do this uh, chain sort prompting without manual examples anymore. So one way people found that to improve the reasoning Furthermore, is by using something called a process feedback. So rather than giving them final step answer, you know, like whether the final answer is correct or not, we want to tell the model which step is incorrect. This gives much better performance than The outcome supervision. Uh, mm. Process supervision by humans or automatic? By human, yeah. I should note that this is labeled it by human, um, so it's uh, it's very expensive. Um, but I would say in the future maybe we can rely on AI models.
to provide this process feedback. And one nice thing is that compared with outcome supervision, process supervision doesn't seem to saturate yet. Um, Yeah, but I should note that this is really expensive to, to collect. You need you need well trained human laborers and it's pretty difficult. So I wanna also note the IOHF stands for reinforcement learning for from human feedback. <coughs> Many of you already are probably already familiar with this because ChatGPT took off and generated a lot of news. Um, but a quick recap is it consists of three steps connecting human demonstration to the supervised fine tuning. And then collect this outcome supervision. You know, like model generate two responses, a label one than as preferred. This is not a su process supervision, this is outcome supervision, because this is more scalable. And then you try a reward model. And then you run PPO reinforcement learning against this reward function to maximize reward. Since the reward captures human preference, ideally, by writing, by running PPO, you, the final model aligns better with human preference. That's, that's indeed true, showing in experiments, the PPO model performs significantly better than just supervised fine tuning model. Another capability I want to note is code generation. Um, the code generation has a lot of potentials. And luckily, the scaling law also holds for code data, not only for language data. So this is a code X, the backbone of GitHub Copilot. Um, you can see that it has different scaling or constant. As we previously mentioned, scaling or constant are uh, data set dependent. But fortunately, encode scaling or also holds. And the accuracy also holds. With bigger model, you get much higher Accuracy. So the past one and the past 100 are both like the code correctness rate. If you generate one solution per problem, or if you generate 100 solutions per problem. So the past one is probably the most important. And you, you see that it increases with larger model. And over context dimension, code knows scales very nice as well. Um, it scales much better than text, as we would expect, because text, human texts are written by, you know, like a general public, and we don't write extremely difficult, extremely difficult to understand text. But for code, you know, you have to keep track of the modules, functions, to have, like, you know, to get code to work. So code is more complicated, it's longer. So larger context window allows much better um, code understanding. Alpha code proposed an interesting technique, I would say called inference optimization. So rather than doing the pre-training and fine-tuning only, they also did large-scale sampling at test time. So they, they have some filtering methods to filter out solutions 
from a very large uh, sample data, data set, you know, solution. And this matters for competition level problems. Again, this is different from previous previous um, graphs because this measures the competition level problems. It's way harder. So you can see that without filtering, it's nearly zero uh, solve rate. But with filtering, you know, this inference time optimization, you can solve 30% of the competition level coding problems. And I guess, I guess you can probably do this iteratively. You have the model generate large scale sampling and the filtering, and then you do supervised fine tuning again. Uh, what does 10, 10 FK mean? Yeah, so it's, it means that if I sample um, K solutions and then I measure how many of them are correct. So you want it to be at least 10? Mm -hmm. So it turns out if you want to improve code generation, the biggest gain seems to come from beta pre-training. So this shows that if you replace the backbone model with Gemini Pro, which is uh, you know, um, an improved version compared with Palm. Palm was the model used in alpha code, if I remember correctly. So turns out you have a, if you have a much better pre-trained model, and you easily get uh, way better performance in code generation. So inference time technique is pretty cool, and better pre-trained model can get you a long way ahead. So for those who are curious, typically when we, the pre-training data set comes from the internet, okay, the pile dash CC stands for common crawl. CC stands for common crawl. Common crawl is basically a, a data set curated from the internet. Okay, all the different websites and so on. It's good to know about this, you know, where the data come from. Uh, the majority of the data comes from the internet. So we need a heavy filtering, as you could imagine, right? Um, well, many of the data, I wouldn't say they are good ideal data, so you need a heavy filtering. Um, so Lama's data set is calibrated towards Wikipedia. It's a really good heuristic. You train a classifier using Wikipedia data, and um, data set that you know are not on Wikipedia. Then you train a logistic regression, okay, uh, to classify this. And then you can run this uh, classifier over other, you know, a you know, large chunk of, you know, very large data set to filter out data that are not uh, similar to Wikipedia. This turns out to be a good heuristic. And by doing the data correctly, um, Lama also with you know good optimization technique and so on. Um, Lama outperforms GPT three um, in the Palm and other models. So when you do your research or work, um, pay attention to the data set. So there are some open source data set. Because Lama's data set was not made publicly available due to you know legal issues and so on. Um, Red Pajama is a pretty good uh, alternative. Um, uh, me and my co author tried to um, reproduce Nama using the Red Pajama data set and some um, further filtering done by ourselves. Uh, we can match Nama performance pretty easily. So, um, I guess uh, the rest of the lecture is mostly about um, practical side of the uh, language model training. 
uh, I guess we, we can cover this in future lectures and we are right about that. So, yeah. Thank you, Hal.